Today we're talking to Jessica Guthrie of One Career and Caregiving Collide. Jessica is a full-time millennial caregiver, advocate, educator, and nonprofit senior executive. Jessica has been full-time caregiving for her mother, Constance, who was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's disease about eight years ago. Um, maybe you can start by just telling us a bit about who you are and, and who you care for and your caregiving journey. Yes. Okay. So hello, everyone. My name is Jessica Guthrie. And I am a caregiver of my mother who is living with Alzheimer's disease. We have been on this caregiving journey for eight years now. Um, I started this journey as a caregiver when I was 26 years old. Um, and I was living in Dallas, Texas. My mother was in Virginia. Um, and so the first half of my caregiving journey actually is a journey of being a long distance caregiver. Um, and doing it from afar, but also traveling home uh, multiple times a month to check in on her and be present. And then the second half of my journey is me very much um, living at home and caring for my mother in her home. Um, I call out my age because that's a critical just part of my identity as a caregiver. I was young early in my career. Um, as an only child, just navigating what it meant to be a 26 year old and then tack on what did it mean to be a caregiver. And so my mother is now in the final stage of Alzheimer's disease. And so she's currently on hospice, home hospice, and I'm caring for her um, as we figure out what does it mean to be on hospice, but still thrive um, uh, in her final months, however long that might be. And so that's a little bit about me. Um. Thanks for sharing. I have a couple of follow-up questions. I guess first is a little bit about what it means to thrive on hospice. Uh, what have you learned so far? What's that experience been like? Yes. Okay. So hospice is one of the most misunderstood services. Even I didn't realize all that went into hospice. So um, I decided to leverage the resource in May of 2022 when my mother went from being someone who was like, thriving, walking, talking, singing, dancing, everything to being someone who was no longer ambulatory. Like she went from being able to walk down the hall to and from her room to now needing full assistance to sit up in her bed. Um, and so she was now fully bed bound um, on top of having a number of infections and just us getting to a point where I was like, this is a really fast progression. And everyone was like, well, you should put it on hospice. They have really great resources. They'll help you. And I, I thought, you know, according to TV, you know, you go on hospice the last two weeks of life, like you're just, you're dying immediately. But that really isn't the case. Hospice very much is about keeping you comfortable um, in your final, however long it might be. But when you sign on to hospice, they say, you know, if your loved one's disease were to take its natural course, would they die within six months or less? And at the time, at the top of May, my answer was like, yes, you're right. And so she was accepted. And so when I talk about thriving on hospice, I learned that hospice has a number of supports that, that, that are there to support you on a weekly basis. So I have weekly nurse visits who check in on her. I have a CNA, one just left to give her a bath multiple times a week. We've got um, music therapy twice a month. We've got the massage therapist. Um, we also have a social worker to help me navigate systems. And so when I say thriving on hospice, one, there's just so many people who now have access to understand the state of my mom and, you know, everything down to a sniffle, a red eye or like, you know, a sore on her on her body. Like there's they are at the at the at the ready to help you keep them comfortable and to solve whatever problem. And so we're, I think she's thriving because she's comfortable. We're thriving because she feels safe and loved and cared for. And the traumatic experiences of hospital, ambulance, people not knowing who you are in the doctor's office, all that's gone. Um, and I think my mom is very strong. Therefore, she's like, you're not going to get rid of me yet. I'm, st I'm still kicking. It's been seven months on hospice and I'm still kicking. So yeah, she's doing great. Yeah. I mean, I imagine that's like peace of mind for you too, to have uh, people that are saying, seeing the same 
the same things that you are. You know, it's hard to explain all the like little nuances of day to day to someone who only sees them every other week or, you know, at the holidays or whatever. Yes. Yes. I think that's the other thing, too. It's like I as a caregiver and those of you who are listening have probably been here, but like, you know, you keep your little booklet of all your documentation, (laughs) right? Like every single trend, everything that's happening, because especially when you're a younger caregiver, going to the doctor's offices, you got to be ready to fight, right? Like, and not fight, but like advocate and, 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 and ask for what you want. And here it's like, okay, I can bring it down a few notches (laughs) because my nurse is keeping all those records and she is seeing the changes. And so it, it brings the stress down for me as the caregiver too, in ways I wasn't expecting. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I'm curious about, you know, you sort of misunderstood what hospice was before you guys were using it. Uh, I'm curious about like how you found hospice care and how you chose this company or agency that you're working with. And what was that experience like? You know, social media is a blessing and a curse. And in this case, it's a blessing uh, because I um I had a few friends on Instagram who's who they had just put their parents on hospice. And I was like, oh, that's like that's an interesting experience. She's getting all these supplies and like talking about this and that. I was like, okay, interesting. And then I asked a couple of friends, like, do you have any resources for me to understand more? And, you know, they had navigated the system with their loved ones. So I was like, okay. So they told me their experiences. And then they gave me some folks to follow and social media for me to understand like all the ins and outs of hospice. So I had all of that information. And then my friend, Jennifer, she said, you need to shop for hospice. Like you shop for your doctor. She was like, in the end of the day, it's a Medicare program and every hospice is different. And so where I live in, I live in a smaller town. I'm sure if I was like in Dallas or a larger city, there'd be more options, but there's only about two hospice options or agencies where I live. And I was already using home health through this agency. So I said, you know, I know the good and the bad and the ugly here. Let's just stay with this, (laughs) you know, um, family of um, companies. And so I stayed with them and that's pretty much how, but I, I did my research. I looked to see like, what did they offer? You know, um, what were the reviews saying about how people's experiences were? And, you know, this is the lesser of two evils. So I chose this one. <laughs> so that's fair. Yep. Um, yeah. I, I, you mentioned Medicare. I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but part of, you know, this podcast and the conversations we hope to have is around, like, how do, how do we find resources that we can afford? How do we afford these resources? Yep. Um, if you're comfortable, can you share a little bit about like the cost of hospice or how you guys are managing that piece of the equation? Mm -hmm. Good question. So there's um, different types of hospice agencies, but the one that people or the way in which people typically leverage it is through the use of Medicare. Um, Because my mother is 74 years old, obviously she's clearly enrolled in Medicare um, and her insurance is a Medicare Advantage plan. Um, And so the way it's currently set up that hospice is fully covered by Medicare. So there's no more like out of pocket costs. There's no more co-pays like you would have if you were going to the doctor or the emergency room. Um, And so literally everything is billed. Now, clearly when it comes to Medicare, there is still a deduction of, you know, whatever the cost, I think it's like 140 a month that my mother is obviously getting deducted, but there's no other cost for Medicare. Um, from, I did look at one of my bills though. It it seems as if a typical month of services from hospice range between $5,000 and $6,000 a month that is then billed to Medicare that then just goes straight to the hospice company. Um, now there are like for-profit hospice agencies. And then of course, like if you have the other means to pay for, you know, direct services, you could do that. But the majority of us in the United States will be using Medicare for hospice. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for sharing. It is wild to see those numbers that get billed and what even just prescription medications or this sort of thing. Those numbers are wild. Wild. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. It is interesting, too, because every hospice agency is different. And so, like, I named all the things that I have and I have another friend. She's like, oh, I didn't have any of that. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I would be curious to look at our bills. Are we billing the are, 
are our companies billing Medicare the same? And are we just getting different services? And then you're just like, that feels unfair. You know, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so interesting. Um, you mentioned previously that you were long distance caring for your mom before, and now you're obviously she's you guys are living together. Um, and it sounds like you, you know, did a big, big move in that just shifting gears for money a little bit. But can you talk a little bit just about emotionally for you? What was that transition like? Woo! Yeah. <laughs> um, so I had my career, right? I was starting my just my my professional life in Dallas. And like everything was there. Like I, I, I graduated from Dartmouth undergrad in 2010. And then I did a program called Teach for America that sent me to Dallas. And so like that was the place that I was to like to grow up as an adult. You know what I mean? Um, and so leaving Dallas and making the choice to come back home and like literally at the time live in my childhood bedroom, right, to be here, it almost felt like a. Am I going backwards? Am I a quote unquote failure? No, I'm not. I'm highly educated. Great job. I'm not a failure. And I'm taking care of my mom. Like this is this is noble and this is what you should do. And like, I absolutely wouldn't change it for the world. But at the time, emotionally, you're just like, I feel like I can't see beyond right now. I'm giving up so much. I was very much feeling like the victim. All of this is happening to me, right? Um, what about opportunities in my job? What about, you know, people still wanting to like, you know, be my friend and invite me to things like all of that was like going through my mind. And I'll never forget packing up my apartment in Dallas. And I just pulled an all nighter because, you know, we never pack appropriately. You just kind of stay up till you're done. And I remember like closing the door and then giving my keys to the um, apartment leasing person. And as soon as I handed her my keys, I just like bursted out in tears. And she was like, are you OK? And I was like, yeah, but my my life is over. Like, I, <laughs> you know, but, you know, you're so young and you're just like, I, I can't see what's next. I just know that I'm supposed to go take care of my mom. And I remember like even going to the storage unit and like be like, OK, it's a new chapter, like all my stuff's in storage. And so. I share those little anecdotes because I think that that is a true picture of where I was emotionally. It's like I knew what I was supposed to do, but I also felt like, oh, gosh, I feel stuck. Um, and will I be behind or will I be missing out on something? However, that was right before the pandemic in what, 2019? And once I got here, I started working virtually and being present with my mom. I was like, oh, this is the right choice. Right. Like my mom loved having me home. And then, bam, the pandemic happened. And I was like, OK, welcome to my world. Everyone's working virtual. This is OK. This was actually a blessing in disguise to get like a leg up. So this wasn't difficult for me. So it all worked out. Yeah, I, I can totally identify with the feeling of feeling like you're moving backwards. I also moved home cross country when my mom was sick and it, I had this the same feeling like I feel like I was on the, you know, had this like momentum forwards, and then it felt like a pause. And it's hard to see in that moment, which is maybe true of like all seasons of life, but just hard to see like what else is going to unfold. Yes. Um, so I totally, I, I totally identify with that. Um, I'm curious, shifting back to talking about finances, you know, what are some of the ways that caregiving has impacted the way that you look at like spending and saving and just general thoughts of, of the future in that regard? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Just a small question. You know, it's interesting. So, you know, I'm a huge proponent of like financial. So I, I, I'm an educator. I was a teacher and now I lead an education nonprofit. So like education very much um, matters to me and also like ensuring that we are um, educating our children for like life, right? And be able to thrive as human beings. And so a huge part of that is like true financial. I believe like we should teach you financial literacy. Kids should be investing in schools, all the things. I say this as someone who did not have good money habits, nor did I see good financial habits from my mom. And I, I start here because when you grow up in poverty, right? When, when you grow up under the poverty line and you see your mother working check to check, when you see, you know, us having to rely on different systems just to make it, 
and how much she sacrificed for me to get to where I am today. Um, you have a different orientation to money. Um, and I just wish, I just wish I was a better saver before all this caregiving stuff happened. Um, I wish I, I knew more about how to make my money work for me because that would have served me really well as a caregiver. But I digress. I'll start there. However, um, I think how this has impacted my outlook. When I first started, I told you I was 26 and I was living in Texas. I worked for a nonprofit, so we weren't making a lot of money. Okay. Um, but like in my mind, I was like, okay, I need to get, I need plane tickets home. I got to figure out a way to get from point A to point B. And so what do you do? Open up a credit card, right? Like, so like, I'm like now racking up all this money here. Oh my gosh, my mom is losing tons of weight. She needs a new wardrobe. I can't, she can't go to church or be out in public looking as if something is wrong with her. I've got to go pay for this. Oh my goodness, medical bills. I didn't realize I could be sending them in because she wasn't making much money. I could have been getting those like written off. I didn't know that. Who was, I was just paying stuff off. And so I'm up here like charging and spending as if I had it. And I for sure as heck didn't have it. But at the time when you're under so much stress and pressure, you just make all these choices to stay afloat, right? And so, you know, fast forward eight years, I'm just like, what, Jessica, that was awful. Why? Like, why? <laughs> um, and so now, you know, I'm I'm at the I'm at, I'm in a position where I can now pay off those credit cards. Like I'm doing that, you know, as quick as I can. Um, and I'm making different choices in terms of like where my money is going. However, I am now dealing with the consequences of choices that I made under pressure and stress and a desire to keep a certain facade up because that's what you do with Alzheimer's, right? Like you protect your people's dignity as long as you can. Um, sorry, I got on a tangent, but that's where I am. I am currently in a space now where I'm just like, okay, so how can I pay off this debt, but also start investing money because I want my money to start working for me. And then also I'm just like, okay, cool. I now have to figure out how do I make sure I have a steady stream of income because I now fully like employ someone to take care of my mom because that's very real, like not take care of her, but for, you know, so I can work, you know, a certain number of hours a day. Um, okay. So I need to make sure that is happening. And now I'm just like, okay, I need this much money to spend. My mother's now paid off her house. And so like, it's like, I am now thinking smarter around wh where my money is going and how I'm making it work for me, for lack of a better phrase. <laughs> But it's been a journey. And I, there was honestly, here's what I'll say. As a caregiver, everyone's like, just go do this. Go do this thing. And you're like, okay. Um, or even like the, the question of like, well, go, um, you need a trust. Go set up a trust. And you're like, you know how much it costs to like speak with a lawyer to set up a trust? Or like your mother needs X, Y, and Z. You're just like, that's $5,000. I don't have $5,000. to either charge it or you just don't have it and you risk it. You know what I mean? Like there's just, the things you end up holding, like, uh, I know I'm supposed to do this, but I can't do this right now. So I'm just going to make it work and just like keep my fingers crossed. She doesn't die. You know what I mean? Like, it's that real as a caregiver. Y'all, you know? <laughs> I do know. Yeah. And I mean, thank you for sharing about like, I mean, the, the reality of, you know, not just your situation, but so many people are going into debt because you don't know what else to do. And this like juggling act that you just described is really real. What are some of the things you were spending on as a caregiver and which ones, you know, which things would you still spend money on or which, you know, like many mistakes did you make that you maybe want to avoid or want to share that someone could avoid in the future? This is kind of a broad question. Just like, where's your money going as a caregiver? <laughs> yeah, your money's going to the most random things, like everything from clothes, food. I also like, you know, full on meal prep to make sure she was eating right? She couldn't shop for herself. So like now you're like buying groceries every two weeks, um, like on top of your own groceries, right? Um, clothing, um, medical bills, flights, because I was traveling back and forth. Um, you, even though at the time I didn't own my mom's house, but you become the person that starts to fix everything up. So like, oh yeah, you need a new uh, refrigerator, you need a washer and dryer, you need a new HVAC system. Okay. Right. And you're just like, because my mother doesn't have it. Like my, you, you talk about this generations of this. 
my mother doesn't have a large saving. My mother doesn't have any investments. My mother doesn't have any other properties besides her home, right? Like, and so who, who gets that is the child, right? And so like all of the home things, which rack, like every year there's something, you know, um, all things with her car because my mother, even though my mother was no longer driving, because I was long distance, I would use her car, which then meant I had to keep up her car. So all that comes with that. Um, I also think that like any like expense that came across, whether it was household or even just like personal for my mom, I ended up picking up. Um, so all of that, which become almost like monthly or, you know, bi-weekly costs, depending on what it is, it just adds up. It adds up. And then, so there's that. And then about halfway through the journey, because my mother had started wandering and um, leaving the house, it was like, okay, she's bored. Okay, we gotta, we gotta find some way to have someone be there with her. So that's when I started leveraging care agencies about four years ago. And I could only afford having someone here three days a week for four hours at a time. But at the time, that's our dad is what, $27 an hour, right? And so then you start to add that, like that was also a huge cost, again, that I was paying for. And hi, like, where I am now, I'm just like, okay, I, this might be a separate question, so stop me if I'm getting ahead of myself, but I um, realized that I could, my mother potentially qualified for Medicaid because in Virginia, leveraging Medicaid, it would at least help go towards the cost of caregiving. Um, and when I went the first time, so this is now four years ago, three years ago, that it's all blending together now. But when I went the first time to get the advice on like the steps to take, the woman, she said, your mother makes too much money. And I said, how? She was a paraprofessional in a local school district. And then she has her social security check. You mean to tell me that's too much money? And in the state of Virginia, she was just above the cutoff. And she was like, Virginia is one, of the, is like one of the stricter states. And I was like, what in the world? And I said, so what are families supposed to do? And she said, well, families just exhaust their resources. And I was like, I don't have any other resources to exhaust. And she's like, well, you could sell the house. And I was like, absolutely not. Because one thing I do know, my mother bought this house for me. My mother built this house from the ground up for me. Um, so that's the last thing I want to do. So I, I share that story because I'm just like, okay, in hindsight, I would have loved to have been on Medicaid. That would have relieved the cost of that caregiving because that was turning out to be, you know, $2,400 a month um, at least. And she, uh, and she didn't qualify, which was like heartbreaking. And so then I was like, so what am I supposed to do now? And people are like, well, just apply for this grant. And you're like, that grant is only $5,000. I could apply for it, but like, it doesn't go that far. And I'm too stressed out. I don't have the time. So I, I didn't, I never did it. So I probably, when I reflect, there are probably spaces where I could have gotten some financial relief and support. Even now, my mother now, because of her, where she is in her illness, she would qualify for Medicaid surely because she's now on hospice and but that process is too long too drawn out too stressful I don't want to go through that right like <laughs> and so I would rather I'm now making financial sacrifices because I don't want to deal with the like the, the 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 systems you know I got off track but I answered part of your question <laughs> no I think you answered my question and more I think that's really okay. useful for people to hear um I get you touched on this a little bit, but I guess like looking back, you know, a grant for $5,000 or a little bit of financial aid here or there, would you have um, like now looking back, would you have spent the time and energy to have applied for those things? Or do you still think maybe it wouldn't make that much of a difference in the big picture? Oh, I think any amount of money would make a big difference. But as a caregiver, when you're in the weeds and for me, working a full-time job, taking care of my mom full-time, cooking, cleaning, being present, by the time it comes around, even though I know it would have been helpful, I didn't have the mental space for it. And so part of me is like, okay, how do we make access to funds a little bit easier for people? Um, because without them having to jump through so many hoops, right? Like, I'm not, I'm not trying to scam anybody. I'm real. Like, <laughs> that's a real journey. So how do I, how did I get funds without having to spend more than 30 minutes on something? You know what I mean? Um, because I just don't have it. And so, yeah, looking back, absolutely. Jessica, you, you could have made time, but in the grand scheme of things, she was like, oh no, there wasn't enough time. 
I also think, I mean, we hear it all the time, but it's like caregivers, you have to take care of yourself, you know, like self-care. And it's like, I don't know. Yes. When you're that exhausted or that run down, it's like, okay, this is my minute to like nap. <laughs> I don't want to fill out a form. I don't want to, like, I totally understand. Yeah. Um, you know, looking back, you say, okay, make time. But in the moment, I understand how you're like, I just can't, I just can't do that right now. I was going to just do a, a shameless little plug for givers just about that's what we're, you know, we are hoping to make this a little bit easier for people so that you don't have to carve out hours and hours of, of filling out paperwork and tracking down the system and calling the office and all of this. We are trying to make funds more easily available to people um, because we know you know, there's a, there's a time and like emotional cost, um, even just trying to find resources that are available to you. Um, you've shared a bit about like your, your journey at large, I guess, from where you sit right now, I'm curious about, um, you know, what's working well in your systems for managing money and, and where do you still feel like you, you know, what could be even better? Where do you still feel like you need help in how you manage money or insurance or financial resources, just sort of all of those pieces? Mm. what's working well okay so i can speak in terms of like lessons okay so um for me like i i think over whether uh what do i want to say given this journey i am crystal clear about my own my personal financial path in setting up whatever my future family will be i say this because i think um that wasn't where my head was eight years ago but like yeah, I've got my life insurance policies set up, right? Like, and they are more than like what my mother's currently is. You know, I've got my own like will and trust set up, right? And, you know, I'm not making a whole bunch of money, but I think one thing I've learned is like um, how you create generational wealth, how you set your family up starts now. And if something were to happen to me, whether it's tomorrow or in the next 10 years, I want to make sure if I have kids or any or a family member that they are not struggling, like I am currently struggling to care for my mom. You know, this is a side note, but it's connected. I, when I was on family leave August through October, I spent the time to go visit funeral homes to prepare for my mom's like end of life service. Whenever it happened, I just wanted to have it done, you know? And you realize how expensive like funeral costs are. And you're like, what in the world, you know? But you realize like, okay, sure. Now I understand why you see people have like GoFundMe so they don't have life insurance or they don't have it set up. And I was like, oh no. So my mother's life insurance policy through her, um, the school system is like a baseline policy, which will cover the funeral costs, but that's it. There's nothing else, right? And so you're just like, okay, woo, can't do that. So anyway, I, I think about that because I now know how expensive even afterlife is for family members. Anyway, I digress. So I feel like I'm more clear about the steps I need to take being in the future. But my current world, um, I was telling someone this. They were like, you know, why why are you still working a job that's based in Texas? Um, why haven't you moved closer to home in terms of like your job? Why are you still working such a, like a big job? Like, shouldn't you, don't you want to do something a little less? And I was like, I don't think you understand is that I have no choice but to work because I need I need to get paid in order to keep up the life and the care that I have for my mom. And so I say this because I think too often as a caregiver, you're put in this like space of like, what choices am I making financially? And a huge one of those is like working and um, like being employed to have a consistent stream of income because you are the sole provider for your loved one. And I think like that, that is, that is a choice that I made, but like, I knew if I moved back home, I would not be making near the amount of money that I'm currently making, nor did I have the brain space to even think about a different type of job, even if that meant me having more time with my mom. I share this as part of like my own financial future because I think that like that's, um, those are trade-offs you make. And at 34, almost 35, um, to set myself up financially, I need to keep my job so that I can still be ready beyond the caregiving experience. You know what I mean? Um, and then the last thing I was just going to say is like, I think now I, because the more progressed your disease becomes, the less you're paying for, the less she eats. There's no other doctor's visits. I'm not having to 
transport her anywhere. And so my money's not leaving me as fast as it was five years ago. And so now I'm just like, okay, what are all the things I need to do to like set up savings for me? Um, and also if I am spending for her, now I'm just like, okay, what are the things that I can like write off <laughs> on my taxes? <laughs> what can I do that's part of like, now that the house is in my name, like how can I put it under like house fixtures? And so I'm just being more smart about choices that I'm making because I have the time to think about smarter choices. And I have, it's not a, a huge cash flow, but I have a, a flow of cash that allows me to make different choices. Because when you are strapped and you're thinking about, do I do $50 for this or $50 for that? You're not thinking about the best choices. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so I think I'm, I'm in a space to see that more clearly now. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Um, I guess in the same vein, you know, you're, you're talking about how you're setting yourself up for, you know, fi future financial success or whatever you want to call it. Um, and you're talking about, you know, how do I save money on the house? How do I save money here? What resources have been helpful to you in like learning that? Is this just you Googling because you've got time to? Are there particular accounts or websites that you like? That's a good question. I would love if this would be a thing that givers can do or can point me to, like I would reputable people to tell me the right stuff. Like even when it comes to understanding my taxes, like I had to bring those questions to my tax preparers, so, like one, find a better tax person. But two, <laughs> I think like I I'm I watch people on Instagram, just like random influencers. I was like, okay, let me let me write those questions down and then go like confirm, right? Like, or go Google or you know, go ask someone else. And so honestly, it's been like other people helping me make better choices be like oh yeah I did that with my loved one go do this right and so that works for the first step because that's not sustainable that's not like generational knowledge and so I wish I could either like go somewhere and have like up-to-date modern like next steps that I could be taking because right now it's hit or miss you don't know what's real what's not and there's nothing that like walks you through step by step and so I'm really just like oh i that person did that. Okay, let me go see if I can do that. You know, like that's, and that's, that's probably not the best. <laughs> well, I guess, I mean, yes, you're right. It's not the best. We can probably find a better solution. And I guess uh, until we, we find it or, I mean, like behind the curtains a little bit, we, you know, we want to, we at Givers want to make valuable like resources and tools for people. And so um, I don't think we have what you're looking for yet, but, uh, you know, behind the curtain, that's useful for us to know about like, what can we be building out and what experts can we pull in to get information all in one, one place. Mm -hmm. Um, this isn't really a question, a specific question, but like your, your handle is, you know, career and caregiving collide, obviously working is important to you, uh, in addition to caregiving. Um, I guess just like any thoughts around this is just like, can you speak a little bit to working and caregiving at the same time and what's been particularly challenging or particularly rewarding about, you know, these two pieces of your life? Yeah. So I came up with when career and caregiving collide because when I became a caregiver, it felt like it was truly like a collision with my like professional and career life. And like, you know, when those two collide, it can either be a chaotic thing or you can make it like there can be really great synergies and balance. And I have been, I recognize my privilege in saying this. I've been really fortunate to work at a place that's been so supportive of my caregiving journey. Um, that is not the case for everyone. And even in such support, there's still so much room to grow to be better supports of family caregivers. But I think holding both um, caregiving and being a career person, it's taught me a lot about um, setting clear boundaries for myself, particularly in my work environment. I am no longer able to burn the candle at both ends. I cannot be available all the time. What does it look like for me to be a productive team member from afar? Um, and so I, I've learned a lot around how do I still stay really present and proximate to my work and also present and proximate to my mom. And that takes some negotiating of energy and time. That takes saying no to a lot of things. It also takes um, trusting and believing in all of like the work that you've done thus far that people don't think you're sitting on the couch eating bonbons, right? Like I, I think um, 
a lot of my struggles balancing career and caregiving in the early years was because I had made up in my mind what it looked like to be professional, what it looked like to show up at work. And I was creating more stress for myself versus pouring that into my mom. And so now I'm really clear about my energy, my time, how I can, you know, contribute. And then what does that also mean for like how I show up for the people that I manage? And I think if anything, now that I'm eight years in, my biggest lesson is like, Jessica, people are looking at you to be an example, even if you don't want to be, around how they can show up as human beings in their workplace and still be a caregiver. How can I, you know, my pe people at my job are now like, oh, like Jessica's resting. I should be resting too, you know? And so I think where I'm at now, I'm realizing like, this is a, it's a dance. It's not a perfect balance, but it's one where like, your values and what your your boundaries and like your integrity is on display and you can choose to lean either way but I think people really appreciate when you show up honestly and like are vulnerable about the vulnerable about the realities of what you're holding oh there's so much there but I I, I do think that like one of the things you often hear is like I I don't know how I'm going to pay for x y and z when it comes to caregiving I have to care for my loved one and I can't afford not to work. And so for me, it's just like, okay, how do we make both work? Because um, we are not in the position to do anything else but to do that. And I think my greatest lesson is like, it's possible. You just have to like be convicted about what matters most to you and not waver from that or else you will be carried away with whatever your work requires of you or whatever caregiving requires of you. Sure. And then no one's getting, getting the best, the best of you or no one's getting the best for them. Like, uh, yeah. 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 Um, thank you for sharing that. And you've shared like a ton of, uh, your lessons, which I think then become advice for other caregivers, no matter where they're at in their journey. But we do like to ask everyone, um, you know, if you can give like one tip, like what's your top tip for other caregivers, what would it be? My top tip is you're truly doing this is maybe a one-liner than a tip you're doing the best you can and I think that there is there is no mold there is no archetype there is no model for what it means to be an excellent caregiver we create those in our heads but what your loved one truly needs from you is for you to continue to show up and to say okay yep here's where we failed here's where we got it right and I'm going to try again tomorrow and so I guess the tip is continue to show up because you're doing the best you can with what you have and the knowledge that you have right now. And the best thing you can do for you is to like recognize that and to get back up the next day and take your lessons and evolve from them. Thanks. I, you said it's a line and not a, not a tip. And I think I really needed to hear that today <laughs> to keep showing up because some days it just feels like you don't want to anymore. So. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, just with me and hopefully it resonates. Oh, it resonates with someone else also. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to to chat with us and share so much of your and your mom's, you know, story together. Um, if people want to find you online, where can they find you? Yes, the best place to find me right now is on Instagram at when career and caregiving collide. It's the same page on Facebook, when career and caregiving collide. Website coming soon, but start on social media first. 